Welcome to the introduction to web technology. This class is the first of several classes of a three-part series which looks at web marketing from different angles. By first understanding how technology works, we can better leverage it to our advantage as more informed marketers. The way I view marketing is from robots' point of view first. I want my marketing efforts to be technically sound, my websites to be optimized. Next, I look at marketing for humans. This is the obvious one. But we want to make sure that we understand what our communication objectives are, what our business objectives are, and how we can reach them through different mediums. Simply put, marketing for dollars is a focus on finding return on investment through customer acquisition and conversion optimization tactics. My name is Rob Berthal. I'm a technologist and a marketer. My passion ranges from software architecture to social marketing to web analytics and conversion optimization. I'm a former staff sergeant with the U.S. Air Force and had a successful consulting career for the last 10 years. I've filed patents on content management and developed a CMS back in 2004, and now I've been focused on software as a service. I'm excited about this course with the University of Hawaii's Pacific Media Program and hope you've gained valuable insight and practical takeaways. As you take the course, you're encouraged to live tweet using the hashtag UHPNM and at Raw. Be sure to also follow at Pacific New Media and like them on Facebook. In today's class, we're going to answer the questions, uh, what the internet is, what is the World Wide Web, some terms to know, as well as talk a little bit about the future of the web, where we're heading. So let's get started by discussing protocols. Simply put, a protocol allows exchange of information between electronic items. In computing terms, it's just a set of rules that lets computers communicate with each other. A protocol says what part of the conversation comes at what time. It also says how to end the, co the communication. Now, an internet protocol is a protocol responsible for addressing, sending, and receiving essentially the data packets that go over the internet. What we have here, we're going to be referencing this kind of cloud-looking item, and that's going to be what we call the internet. The internet often is um, referenced as a cloud. So the, the red line that connects the two of them is the internet protocol. So it's a protocol that allows the computers to communicate with each other through the internet. TCP IP uh, oftentimes comes before IP. So a lot of times you'll hear TCP slash IP. So TCP is transmission control protocol. Really all this does is it shrinks the packet before it goes uh, out and then expands it, assembles it essentially again uh, once it arrives. So most of us know what the internet is. In its simplest form, it's just a bunch of computers all connected together sharing information. When a lot of times we don't always fully understand how we are connecting to the internet, so I thought I'd put a graph out here. Um, really in, a, in its basic form, we're either on a laptop which uses a wireless connection or on a desktop that has a hard wire uh, and that goes to a router. The router is connected to a modem. Oftentimes a router can also be a modem uh, in one little box and that connects to your internet service provider. Um, once you've connected to your ISP or your internet service provider, you're essentially on the internet and you can now have access to browse other servers uh, that are available. The internet in its simplest form is our computer connecting to a server, right? Connecting to the cloud, connecting to files uh, that are outside of our, off of our, off of our computer. Uh, those servers can then connect to other servers that also hold files. Um, and then they can also connect you know, to other computers, right? So it's this, this kind of this web, this huge kind of mixture of, of, um, of computers connected to each other, sharing information, sharing files, etc. Now, we all know that uh, internet allows us to email, uh, you know, upload and download files, you know, collaborate, it allows for information gathering, and it connects other devices, not just computers, cell phones, faxes, whatever it could be, could all be connected through the internet. So a subset of the internet is the World Wide Web. A lot of times we see it's WWW, right? So the World Wide Web, um, really the difference of that is that it, it, it's all linked together using something called hypertext. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. So if we're in our web browser, we always type in HTTP colon slash slash, and then the domain name we're looking for and then the file we're looking for. So that HTTP is simply just the protocol we're using to access that information. So an HTTP request is sent, and that's sent from your web browser. That goes to the server and says, hey, I'd like to access this file. And in a nutshell, it gets that file sent back to them. It, we're going to talk more about browsers in a little bit, but it'll then decode that file so we can view it like a website. The question may be, how do we get that file on the internet to begin with? Well, 
we use that through file transfer protocol. So that's FTP. You may have, if you've ever worked on a website, um, you may have heard, you know, what's your FTP? I need FTP login, etc. It's just a file server on the internet, uh, or it's a way to access your web server. So you can, from your local host, from your computer, upload a file to the web server, and once it's there, everybody can see it. FTP software, I like a program called FileZilla, but FTP software is that tool that allows you to take files and send them to the web. So, a lot of information, but let's keep calm and let's recap. In a nutshell, we use Hypertext Transfer Protocol, HTTP, to access websites. We use the File Transfer Protocol to store and retrieve files from the internet. It's that simple. So let's reapproach this concept with uh, maybe a little more of a tangible example. Um, to start, if we were to make a website, to start what we would need is an HTML document. Now, an HTML document is, stands for Hypertext Markup Language, and this is the language of the web. We'll talk more about how to create an HTML file in a different video, but for right now, let's just assume that the file exists. The HTML file is then read by a browser. The browser's job is to essentially decode the HTML and turn it into something that's very easy for us to read and understand. Now, there are a lot of different types of browsers. There's Chrome, Firefox, Safari, and that's about it. Chrome is my favorite browser. That's what I use on a regular basis. Um, more than likely, if you're on a Macintosh or an iOS device, you're using Safari. A new term for us to learn is hypertext. So we've all seen on websites, the, you know, be able to click on a link and it takes us to the next page. That's all it is. That's considered a hypertext. The hypertext transfer protocol is really based on this idea of linking one site to another you know, and one page to another, uh, the ability to call files, etc. When we look at a website, a lot of times we don't think about what goes in behind the scenes. And again, that is the source. So the browser job, like I mentioned, is to you know, show us uh, you know, the website in a way that's easily consumed by us. But if we were to ever go view source uh, on a website, we would see all the code that's typed in to actually make that site exist. So a browser interprets that in something we can see. The HTML document is made up of a few different sections. So when we create a tag, now a tag is the little bracket, and then the tag name, and then the bracket closes. We always want to close the tag. So we'll notice that there's a HTML, and then there's another one that says HTML, but it has a little backslash. So that's how the tag closes. We'll also notice there's two main sections to an HTML document. The first section is head. This is all the, the information that's kind of behind the scenes that tells the browser um, you know, what the title of the page should be, if there's any kind of scripts or any kind of additional information that it needs to serve up that's not really seen directly. The second main area that we all know is what's called the body. And the body has the content that we typically view. Um, again, there's another tutorial um, just on HTML if you want to learn more about that. Um, but we're going to keep moving on. Um, so we've now created these HTML files. We have them on our computer, but how do other people see them if they're just on our computer? Well, we need a web host. A web host is just a computer that's turned on, has access to the internet. A lot of times we're gonna be paying for this, so it's typically a hosting provider. And that's just a web server that's um, you know on, has access to the internet that we can connect to and store our files on. Again, as we talked about earlier, if we wanna transfer our files from our computer to the web server, we use File Transfer Protocol, or FTP. Once the files have been transferred to the, to the web, uh, anybody with internet access can now see them. So any computer can now see the files. But there's so many servers out there, there's so many different files and websites, how do we keep them all track, right? Well, the same way that we have neighborhoods and our neighborhoods have addresses, um, IP addresses are the address for internet protocol. So we may have seen, you know, 127.0.0.1, that's essentially your local host, or 99.25.65, you know, any of the numbers can go on. Uh, note that multiple websites can actually share the same IP address. And when we talk about search engines, we'll talk about uh, things like dedicated IP addresses and whatnot. But now just to keep it simple, your website has an IP address. But nobody would use an IP address to refer to it. Right? We wouldn't go run a radio ad campaign saying, visit us on the web at 127.0.0.1. .0 .0 .1. 
we wouldn't remember it, right? So we use business on the web at company.com. Now, that company.com is what's called a domain name. We're all pretty familiar with this. Uh, the .com is what's called a top-level domain extension, and that refers to a commercial website. Other examples are .org for organization, .net for network, .gov for government, .edu for education, and a host of all, a lot of new ones that have been coming up uh, over the years. In addition to uh, those ones mentioned, uh, there's also country extensions. So every country has its own. We are .us, .ca is Canada, et cetera, et cetera. So let's get back now to this idea that a domain name is really equal to an IP address in its simplest form. How does a domain name know which IP address to route to? Well, that's called Domain Name Services, or DNS. So there's a database that essentially says, hey, if you're looking for mycompany.com, you're actually looking for this IP address. If you've ever had your webmaster say, point your DNS records over to this IP address, right? It may sound like a lot of Greek, but it's really pretty straightforward. That just says, you own the domain name, you need to point what's called the A record for your website over to this IP address of the hosting account that they likely set up for you. Now, if it's your email, that's considered an MX record. So A records for websites and MX records for email. There are a lot of other ones out available as well, uh, but those are the two most common. Let's recap. Hypertext markup language is a language used to create a web page. A web page needs to be hosted on a server for others to see it. A domain name resolves to an IP address where the website you know, essentially is located and the Internet Explorer is horrible. So let's talk about content management systems or a CMS. Managing a lot of files, especially um, you know, with all the HTML and the, and the themes and, and et cetera, can be a lot of work. So luckily for us, there's what's called a content management system to help us with our job. A CMS, simply put, is an application designed to make it easy for non-technical users to manage a website. One of the big advantages of a content management system is it has a WYSIWYG editor. WYSIWYG is what you see is what you get, meaning that you're designing the website in a visual mode rather than in text mode. WordPress is a content management system that is the best on the market today. WordPress has two modes, visual and text, that allow you to both edit the source or also edit it in the visual mode. I uh, highly recommend WordPress. I actually have a full um, video just on WordPress optimization uh, that you can take a look at as well. We've been talking so far about really the content of the site, but not the design that kind of uh, wraps the site. So when we think about a website, there's two main areas. There's the content itself, and then there's the look and feel that kind of wraps around the content. This information that wraps the content is what we call a theme, right? A theme is essentially a header, a sidebar, and a footer. Now, you can have custom themes as well as kind of uh, off-the-shelf uh, generic themes uh, that you can get and then customize to your use. It's important to know that as you browse a website, uh, you look at it from either a desktop or a mobile device, and that site, you want to make sure that it looks good on the device you're looking at it. A new term for you is responsive website design. So while you may have a website, if it doesn't look good on your mobile device, you may be losing customers. So many of our uh, online visitors now are coming from mobile devices. We want to make sure we have a website that adapts down to them. Now, you have the opportunity to have a whole other website. A lot of times it's m.mydomain.com or uh, etc. But that's not as preferred as having a responsive website design where it's one domain, one website, and the information just hides or shows based on the resolution. So let's recap. A content management system makes managing a website very easy. WordPress is the best content management system, and your website should use a responsive theme so that all devices view it correctly. It's great to understand kind of where the web is going, and to understand that we need to know where the web has been. The first website was created in 1991 by Sir Tim Berners-Lee pioneer uh, in the uh, online space. Over the next about eight years, the web started taking shape from being a portal to actually being a transactional internet with browser-based email, online banking, etc. To visualize this, it was really a read-only web. 
this idea that you could download a song, you know, read an article, you know, find out information on a person, you know, even read an online book, but it was all a one-way communication. It was just a poll situation, read only. Um, you know, as the web evolved, really right around 1999, the second stage of development of the World Wide Web came about, and it's characterized by a change from static sites to more of a growth of social media and, and, and a collaboration. So now on that same song, we can write reviews. We can collaborate on an article. We can connect and share with somebody. We can discuss a book, right? This interaction really has taken the web to a whole nother level. We're right now in Web 3.0, and Web 3.0 is the third evolution of the web that's identified as what's called semantic web. Now, loosely that just means it's a mapping and understanding the relationship of all the content and its participation with each other. So if we were to draft that, it's the same items, but now we have a little more context, a little more understanding about that data. Maybe an article is written by a particular person. That particular person maybe was writing, uh, reading a specific book. Maybe a, a song references a book. Maybe a person loves this song, right? This idea of understanding the relationship of data it starts to form the semantic web. Now, uh, there's a lot more in-depth element to it. Um, we won't get into that in this one here, but I actually have a whole post just on semantic web and how it plays into search engine optimization. But in a nutshell, it uh, allows for tailor-made search, personalized search, and really, and really a deductive reasoning. The next evolution, web maybe 4.0, is this idea of an Internet of Things, or IoT. This term refers to a network of objects which haven't historically been connected to the Internet. The evolution of the Internet will include everyday objects with network connectivity available to send and receive information and data. So it could be potentially, um, you know, your refrigerator could t tell you that it's out of milk, right? Your, uh, when you walk in the room, your, your lights could go on. Um, in some cases, it already happens with that. Uh, this idea that every uh, thing that we that we use uh, could have its own IP address, right? And it could be reporting and receiving information for us. The next kind of evolution likely will be an emotional web. And without getting too far out there, likely Web 5.0 will be um, this kind of uh, an interaction between humans and computers. What I mean by that is the web currently is emotionally neutral. Right, which means the web doesn't perceive users' feelings or emotions, and um, this will likely change. Tim Berners-Lee has predicted this as uh, a likely evolution of where the web is going. So that's really a, um, just the basics of web technology in a nutshell. I recommend that you break off um, to also take a look at the HTML video, the WordPress optimization video, um, as well as uh, continue on with to the next class, which is uh, on-page search engine optimization. I hope you found this useful. Um, by all means, please uh, tweet this on, you know, out to me. Um, hashtag WebIntro, hashtag UHPNM, and uh, let me know what you thought.